Okay, here is the first of probably several lecture videos for my Upward Bound students at West Virginia State Summer 2015. Again, as promised, we've gotten through the history stuff. Now I am also required to cover with you the basic theories of psychology. So, sparing you the classroom time on this, and we'll do it via video. Same deal as before, you will be accountable for this information on your first exam. Uh, the take-home part again being given to you Friday, the in-class part Monday. So take notes just like you did on the, la on the last videos. You will have to submit these notes to me for a grade Monday. I'll need those Monday mornings so you've got some time. Again, you have the link. You can watch these repeatedly. And again, you will be submitting your notes for a grade. I'll guide you a bit as well in terms of what to write down. Now if you're reading chapter one in the book, also you'll get a little bit of reinforcement, but this is really the best way to go. Um, there are many different theories we could talk about. I'm going to start with a random cool picture because anytime you talk about theory, students either roll their eyes or they fall asleep, or maybe they do both. <laughs> but hopefully we won't do that. I'm going to make this as interesting as possible. And it is important to understand these four major theories because subsequent discussions and lecture that we do is is going to draw upon these theories, so it's important to kind of understand. And I'll, like I said, I'll try to make this as um, palatable as possible. Now, psychology is a science. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Uh, the first major theory of psychology is called structuralism, and this is in your book in chapter, I believe, in chapter one as well. Uh, our founding father, as previously discussed, Wilhelm Wundt. And a student of Vunt by the name of Edward Titchener uh, actually founded this, this first theory. Okay? A theory is a broad set of assumptions that tries to explain some kind of circumstance or phenomenon. You don't have to know that, but that's what a theory is. And that's what these big theories are trying to do. They're trying to explain things that are happening to individuals. Now, the first theory of psychology focused on identifying what are called the building blocks of consciousness. When we say consciousness, if you are conscious, that means you are, by definition, aware. If you're thinking about something, you are aware of that. So the first and the early psychologists tried to uh, go about identifying these elements of conscious experience. What is it that makes up your conscious awareness? You're thinking about something right now. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's an exercise regimen. Maybe it's your significant other. I don't know. So that's whatever it is that you're thinking about right now. What are the elements of that conscious experience? More about that in a second. The way that we identify these elements of conscious experience is through a process called introspection. Uh, introspection literally translates to look within or to look inside of. Uh, we, we all become introspective at times. Sometimes we make a mistake or sometimes we do something and we think, eh, maybe I could have done things a little differently. Sometimes you have to take the good hard look in the mirror, right? To figure out what is it that, that I've done wrong? How could I be better? That's being introspective. It's not objectively verifiable. In other words, we can't really prove thought processes. That's one of the problems with this theory. You could tell me what you're thinking all day long, but I can't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're thinking what you say you're thinking for a lot of reasons. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go. Now, Structuralism, again, the very first theory or school of thought in psychology. You want to have this in your notes, again, identifying the elements of conscious experience. So our founding father, Wilhelm Wundt, was a big proponent of structuralism. As we're moving forward here. Uh, Wundt characterized two types of elements of consciousness. So there are two types of pieces of conscious experience. First, sensations. We talked about that in class already. Uh, sensations, that's, we're talking about the raw information that you take in through your senses, through your eyes, your ears, etc. And also feelings, feelings such as anger, love, and fear. And again, the way that we go about this is through a process called introspection, which literally means to look inward. Now, I'm going to try something, hopefully this works. Think about it like this, the early therapists when in trying to identify the elements of conscious experience, as you can see, 
if you can read that, that says elements of conscious experience. Think about a grid. The overall grid itself represents your conscious experience, whatever that is. And the way that we get about or we understand your conscious experience is to go through a process called introspection. There it is. So, for example, I could have you introspect about this pen. See, it is a yellow highlighter pen. So, how might we do that using this, this grid? Well, what I would do if we were in class, I would ask you to tell me everything, state aloud everything you understand to be true about this pen. Okay? And I would start to get responses like, well, it's yellow. It has a black cap. It has ink in it. It has writing on it. It's like a cylinder. It's plastic. Okay, so very basic things. And what we do is we start to fill in the elements of conscious experience. As you can see, ink, it writes, has a black lid. It smells funny. If you take the lid off and sniff it, it smells funny. It's yellow. I don't know if you can read that or not. Okay, it has writing on it. So sooner or later, we're going to fill this grid up, and then we're going to get a completed grid. And you're going to have identified the elements of your conscious experience as it relates to this pen. Ooh. Ah. Let's make a more practical example here. I once uh, did an exercise, and the early psychologist would do this too. Let's say that you ladies, I'll speak to you for a second. Let's say that you've recently broken up with your significant other, assuming a boyfriend, okay? And I, and I did this recently. I asked my class, uh, a girl in my class, to introspect about her ex-boyfriend filling in the grid. So what she did was she identified the elements of her conscious experience as it related to her ex-boyfriend. And some of the things that she came up with, as you can see, are cheater, jerk, liar. She did say he was tall, and that she said also that he was 20 years old. And she said, as you can see here, some other things that I can't repeat on this video without getting fired about how she felt about him. Sooner than later, she filled up this entire grid with her what would be called elements of conscious experience as it related to her ex-boyfriend. Now, you're probably thinking, what in the crap are we talking about all this for? How useful is this? Well, that was the major criticism of this first theory of psychology is it didn't really help people feel or function better. We could sit around and introspect all day about a couch, about a pen, about an ex-boyfriend or an ex-girlfriend, about anything, and we could identify the elements of, of your conscious experience, but it doesn't help us get, pay, uh, get beyond the problem and to feel and function better. What it did do, this first theory, structuralism, what it did do for us is it got us thinking about the mind and how we think and how we organize our thought processes. It got us thinking about and talking about conscious experience. So that was good. So we find that structuralism quickly passes. And then the second major theory of psychology, functionalism, comes to be. Uh, William James is considered to be sort of the founder or pioneer of, of the functionalist school of thought, or functionalism theory. He was influenced by Darwin's theory of evolution. He studied how the mind helps people to function in their environment. So now the functionalists are coming along, they're coming along and saying, you know, this introspection stuff is all good and well, but how does how does our thinking and how do our thought processes help us adapt? How do they help us feel and function better as human beings? That should be the focus of psychology. What's the function? The word function is in there. What are the function of our thought processes? Um, so they focused on very practical issues initially such as improving education. So, functionalism asks this question. What are the functions of our cognitive processes? Uh, have you ever stood back and thought or wondered, why is it that we think the way that we do? Do they serve purposes? Do they protect us? Do they help us become enlightened? Do they help us ultimately feel and function better? So, And let's go ahead and call that actually the end of the first part here for this video lecture. Thank you.